So today we'll talk about political speech and um, because that is the main subject of t uh, this particular workshop and um, we'll just go through it and we'll um, then you can ask the question. So wh what I want to begin with is a paper that I actually presented at IPRA uh, I think the one before the last or maybe the last one and it begins with Weizmann and Fetzer and they point out that contemporary media discourses according to them allow for a sort of uncoupling of space and time and thus communication with distant others. This is a point Brooke made yesterday. They, Wiseman and Fetzer that is add that unlike face-to-face -face interaction this enables the construction of ordinariness as a public endeavor. So how do we construct ordinariness in the public sphere? That is the question we are going to be discussing today. And they say that this production of ordinariness is generally produced and interpreted in accordance with institutional and genre specific constraints. So what do they mean by uncoupling? They have said that space-time uncoupling occurs in today's mediatized discourse. Uh, that is Fetzer and uh, Wiseman. In this talk, I want to argue that the first ethnomethodological turn in the US uh, of in the 1970s uh, may also have uncoupled conversation from its context to the extent that it relied on tape recordings as a primary source of data and I will just show you in a minute what Harvey Sachs said about this. Transcripts made from these tapes engendered analytic procedures whereby the mechanics of co co uh, conversational turn taking could be studied independent of the face to face circumstances in which they occurred. In other words, not only did CA rely on a machine, that is the tape recorder, they presented conversation itself as a machine with technical parts that could be separated, that could be separately dismantled and studied with precision without reference to the uh, messy intentionality of the speaker. When we come to speech act theories, we find there's a lot of emphasis on I intentionality, but in this sort of CA data, they tried to uh, keep intentionality out of the analysis because they felt it was messy. Now this word tapes in the 1970s was very significant in the sense that there were the Watergate tapes, there were all sorts of things going on in the 70s and 80s. So tape recording was critical in this discourse and you need not take my word for it. This is from Harvey Sachs and this is what he says. So this is just a page from his discourse and he said the tape recorded materials con um, constituted a good enough record of what happened. O other things to be sure happened but at least what was on the tape uh, had happened. If it was not from any large and general interest in language um, or from some theoretical formulation of what should be studied that I started with tape recorded conversations but simply because I could get my hands on it and I could study it again and again. So this notion of um, uh, having something on record which you could go to it again and again was enabled for Harvey Sachs by uh, the tape recorder. So the work he said I'm doing is about talk. It is about the details of talk and in some sense it is how, about how conversation works. Now this is important because I wanted to make a connection between the emphasis on technology today and ordinariness recordings and the emphasis um, which was there in the 70s which many people seem to have forgotten. So we are talking about ordinariness and participation in ordinariness by um, researchers 
and finding that the details of talk are very important for people to attend to and how could they be recorded via the machine of a tape recorder. So the construction of ordinariness as we saw uncoupled from space and time in the 70s has now, it is my argument, been replicated as um, uh, Fetzer and um, Wyben seem to be implying. Uh, uh, Wetzer and um, this, uh, Wiseman are saying or, uh, ordinary construction, so today we have ordinary construction with a different set of tools. So ordinary construction as a public endeavor is what Wiseman and Fetzer talked about on our panel in Ypres last time. And they point out that the contemporary media discourses allow for another sort of uncoupling of space and time uh, and communication with distant others. Uh, and this is unlike, according to them, face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and thus, it's, a, it's different kinds of institutional constraints are involved. Ordina now, what constitutes ordinariness in this technological format? What constitutes ordinariness is ordinary people can be recorded, can be uh, recorders, and because they have cell phones, they have all sorts of instruments which enables them to pick up detail. So, a mass construction of ordinariness and an interactional co construction of ordinariness, just as tape recorders in the 70s did this. Now, one might ask, why wasn't television? Why can't television be something like a mass recording device? Because television studios in the 70s and even now are pretty uh, cumbersome. You have to have people come to the studio and do all sorts of things. So though, uh, though they are a mode of discrimination, putting uh, instruments or technologies in the hands of ordinary people, in the 70s it was the tape recorder, and in today, in the early 21st century, it's all these others uh, or other often handheld devices, so smartphones, etc. So now what I want to look at today is the construction of ordinariness, not only uh, against the background that everybody can be involved in collecting data, but also uh, in terms of public discourse or the public sphere or in particular political discourse. So we have all these e-tools, but in addition to the e-tools of recording, we also have a new set of tools to analyze data. And these are also at the fingertips of hundreds of people. So they are graphs and pie charts and, you know, quick um, analyses of word counts, etc. And we all use them. SPSS software, for example. So we have that sort of technology as well, which makes uh, ordinariness part of the research design of uncoupling. So now in the mechanics of political talk, what we are going to be looking at is how political talk is reconfigured through the mechanics of coupling. And just as we had in the 70s, the tape recorder as a mass tool, today we have these EI phones and so on, as well as these data analytic devices. So I am suggesting a, a quite a complex a study, and what I'll try to do is to prove the hypotheses that we have. So uh, this is not familiar to all of you, many of you, but will be familiar to Jenny, Jeff, and so on, because this was very important for a for what they call a systematic of talk or conversation. So look at these features, and you can check all of them. Speaker change recurs, or at least this this was the famous paper by Sack, Shekloff, and Jefferson. Um, occurrence of more than one speaker at a time, you know, um, a, a relative distribution of time is not specified, what parties say is not specified. So this is a very detailed analysis of what is the mechanics of turn taking in conversation. Okay, and this you could record on the 
on the tape recorder, but of course you couldn't record at that time visuals on the tape recorder. So what I have suggested and what I am now working on is uh, quite recently that gesture change recurs or at least occurs. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, one gesture occurs at a time. Gestures almost always accompany speech and only occur briefly, if at all, in isolation. Typically, gestures show a preference for one hand over the other. So these are my criteria for the study of gesture today using simple recording devices. Among individuals, as we shall see, a clear preference for three or four types of gesture. So all of you can be doing this analysis because all of you have reference, have phones and so on. You can look at gesture today in a way that Sachs and others with their simple mass technologies were not able to accomplish, although they did accomplish one thing, which was, as Petzer and Weisman put it, uncoupling in the sense, as Sachs said, that we could study the tapes over and over again. But I am applying the same systematic to gesture, which all of us can study today. And the idea is that everyone can be involved with these handheld and simple, simplified technologies. Uh, so uh, we will look at, so these are my things for gesture, my criteria for gesture. The sachs shedloff and Jefferson paper is a famous one. This one has not been published, but I have been testing the data. So, um, so we we'll, we we'll look at the data in relation to the creation of theory based on an idea of uncoupling of space and time for the reason that Sachs specified that you can study this data over and over and over again and come to finer and finer descriptive uh, descriptions of what the data is doing. And you can use those other tools, uh, e-tools. So um, one of the features that we are going to look at is that gestures unrelated to speech can occur, such as brushing away of a fly. but it is not the case that um, uh, you know uh, that this happens a lot. A lot of many gestures are actually coordinated with speech and hands. So we are looking at creating. I'm looking at creating a simple systematics of gesture, uh, as opposed to the Shagloff's uh, simple systematics of speech. So. Uh, now, one difference in my analysis thus far and the Sachs, Shedloff, and Jefferson paper. Their emphasis was on looking at the coordination of turn taking among ordinary people and how ordinary people problematized discourse. In looking at public sphere data, although that's not the only type of data I'm looking at, the analytic focus is on observing the fine-tuned coordination of gesture with speech in a single speaker. So we are looking at politicians. Uh, uh, in, the t in the talk interaction of ordinary people with the public. Uh, so in this case, the emphasis is less on turn taking as a cognitive coordination of speech and gesture. Okay, so uh, we look at how a single politician orients towards their audience. So one thing we are going to be looking at is gesture, speech, and narrative. That is the narrative of Indian politics. I'm going to be taking, I have already done this paper on Modi's language, which is extremely elaborate, and was published in 2013, just prior to the election. So it got a lot of attention, and still gets a lot of attention. That was within a Darwinian framework of fight and free reactions. But I won't mention that. I'm now looking at a new set of younger politicians. Four Indian politicians from northern India, two from UP, uh, and one from the Punjab, and one from Uttarakhand. 
all are between, I know I'm using young in a strange way, but this is how it's used in Indian discourse, uh, between the ages of fi uh, 35 and 55. And two are from the Indian National Congress and two are from the Bharatiya Janata Party. I will concentrate on the first two, that is the Congress, but I, well actually I'll do both. And um, I want to add, uh, so Sack Shercloth and Jefferson talk about, uh, talked about doing being ordinary. People agentively construct ordinariness in conversation. I want to also talk in our context of political discourse, doing being extraordinary. And so I'm introducing a new category, and I want to look at these two categories in terms of gesture. So, um, to move on, doing being extraordinary. So here I go to narrative data. Lebov and Valetsky on the danger of death narratives, which I've already mentioned to you. Uh, uh, so they say, so they, his statement, Lebov and Valetsky's, their statement was, we find that most narratives are so designed as to emphasize the strained and unusual character of events. So he said, Lebov said, it's always relevant to say, um, uh, I saw a man pushed off the bridge yesterday. Whereas if you say, I brushed my teeth this morning, people might question it's relevant. They were, so they said, people emphasize the strange and or extraordinary character of the events. So if you said something like, I found um, you know, a fly on my toothbrush, that is moving it further towards an extraordinary event. So you can manipulate content to project unusualness or extraordinariness versus ordinariness. But Sachs says something entirely different from Lebov and Valetsky. So one theoretical problem we have is how do you actually bring these together in looking at the systematics of gesture. So Sachs says the problem is I've looked at earthquake narratives and so on and what we find is it, it seems plain enough that people, remember he's interested in the construction of ordinariness by ordinary people, it seems plain enough that people monitor the scenes they are in for their storyable characteristics and yet the awesome, overwhelming fact is that they come away with no storyable characteristics. So Sachs stresses that one of the noteworthy features of storytelling and conversation is the way in which tellers strive to achieve the nothing happened sense of really catastrophic events. So what Lebov is saying is you have to turn a story into something which is of some storyable significance, extraordinary. What Sachs is saying is no, people undergo terrible disasters and they try to mitigate it and say it was nothing. How do we reconcile these two features of storytelling? Sachs talks about the overwhelming banality of the features we find. I have done a lot of this and a lot of this, some of this data is in narrative gravity. Certainly the quotes to which we will come are uh, uh, there and I want to stress that you have a contradiction in framework and our job is to understand gesture and storytelling in political discourse which I'm going to be talking about today but also other kinds of discourse to understand how we reconcile these theories. So there are the conflicting perspectives. So public narratives in the current Indian case these are national narratives that seek to engage tellers and listeners in a public endeavor. And what happens is that, we, oh, I'm going to show, that reportable story materials has to be rendered ordinary. So you're talking, a politician is talking about, let's say, a disaster or something. He, the way he uh, makes ordinariness out of that is saying he could have been a victim or they could have been a victim, it, it could happen to any one of us, even if it is a catastrophic event. And conversely, ordinary story material, uh, ha, uh, so he can take 
be his own life and he can say, you know, I'm really very ordinary, uh, but my life is reportable because I'm engaging with you. I'll show you exactly that, how this happens with regard to data. So, political narratives, uh, in this research, I suggest that most political narratives are at once tellable in that they concern matters of high public interest and they are at the same time banal in that they regularly present well-worn themes, corruption, economic issues, etc., and that are quite familiar to the public. So, they are of great interest and they can involve disaster, at the same time they are repeated, they are well-worn, they are boring. So this is what we are getting in public. So under such circumstances, the problem then becomes, how do politicians manage to make their stories into something for us? I mean narratives of ordinariness. So I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, how we make some uh, a story, a political, a high political narrative into something for you and me. How do politicians do it? Now we have a polarity in the political sphere. A politicians can be one of us or not one of us. And this is where the discourse of dynasty comes in. So we, you know, we have a huge discourse around the Congress party saying Rajiv Gandhi, eh, Rahul Gandhi is only there because he is a political dynast, he is a political heir, he is really not one of us. With the other two politicians, Adityanath and so on, that I am going to be looking at, they are one of us for the public. Okay, so now we are getting a nice polarity between the dynas and the non dynas but then I'm going to be sh showing you in gesture, in manner, in speech, and in clothing, which I all consider parts of embodiment, these two, these two sides split, and we can study it as the ethnomethodologist would like without necessarily going into the messy business of emotions. However, I am interested in emo emotions, so I am going to try to make a connect. So the first gesture I wa look at is a gesture, this r thing is not complete, so I am not going to be presenting all of it, is that I was surprised that this gesture is a it's, it's a constructed gesture. It's, it's a cultural gesture. And it is something which you find in India and all of South Asia. Correct? You know it. So it's, if you go to Burma, you'll find it. If you go to Thailand, if you go to Indonesia, there is the Namaste. However, you won't get the Namaste in any Western country where the handshake is also a constructed gesture. In my own research, I have always been interested in how, what are the points at which language relies on other forms of communication, broadly speaking, and more specifically, when does language break down? And that's why I mentioned emotion. So for you, the question might be, so when does language break down, when you can't find a word or something? For me, language breaks down most in situations where emotion is to be conveyed. So if you meet somebody, a friend, who's, let's say, whose mother has died or whose son has died, you may not have words, but you may put your arms around them, or you may hold their hands. That is where gesture is taking over the, from the role of language, but most of the time, Emotion and gesture and language go side by side, or at least that is my hypothesis, and this is why I've laid out a systematic <laughs> systematics. Uh, you all know about Gandhi. This is for the people who are not from Rahul Gandhi. What is important is that he belongs to this family. His, as we will see in his narrative, the fact that members of his family died um, violent deaths comes up again and again, and so on. So. Now, uh, he is called Papu, he is considered close to his mother, and I will show you how the gestural system or the body language system shows this. Then we have Varun Gandhi. Now, Varun Gandhi is Rahul Gandhi's cousin, as you know, but he belongs to the other party, right? So, 
they are uh, different political parties, but they have the same dynastic heritage. Both of them have had violent deaths in the family. Both of them use this, and both of them, uh, we, I will show, show an extraordinary similarity, even if belonging to uh, different parties. So, um, and here, uh, what I've caught them is doing the namaste, but I'm going to be looking at different gestures today. But with the namaste, what's interesting is the angle you hold, you hold the namaste as angle to the body. So you can go all the way like this, and all the way up, and you can put your palms together, but one thing we can be sure of in the Indian context is that an, the namaste is an essential part of public discourse, and it, particularly political discourse, because it comes at the beginning and the end. So what uh, in the West they would call openings and closings and uh, you know conversational analysis thing, hello, goodbye, is done often gesturally with the namaste, not necessarily even spoken, but simply showing through gesture that you acknowledge the other. It's particularly prominent in political discourse. In fact, I have not been able to find instances where the opening sequence of gesture does not contain the namaste in political discourse. So we are, I'm looking for counterexamples, so please produce them if you have them. Okay, now we see the family tree, which again will be familiar, but there are these two cousins, Rahul Gandhi and Varun Gandhi, now third generation of politicians and why they are, in, you know, what, how they come together. So there's a family lineage there. Now we come to two very different politicians and, you know, they, they have a very different lineage. So this is Yogi Adityanath. The one thing to notice is that your, the Adityanath had extremely humble origins, but what is interesting is he left his family, he renounced it, and he had an independent status as a leader of the Gorakhpur Mutt. So he is important politically and otherwise, even though he is not dynastic, he has renounced his family, he has joined the lineage of the Mutt, and this gives him independent authority. We can come back to Adityanath. This is Navjot Sidhu. Uh, so we have two from the BJP and two from the politicians. Now, Sidhu is the oldest, but he often projects uh, uh, the most dynamic image through his body language. And he is known nationwide as a cricketer. Again, he has independent standing. His father was not a cricketer, but he is. And he's famous. And so, again, he has independent standing, which can be converted into political cachet. So you see uh, the difference. Uh, we, I found thus far the Gandhis tend to hold it close to the body, but Sidhu goes like this quite different with the gestural system. We are still analyzing the data. So I won't say more about the namaste, but I will say that it's a marker of openings and closings. I want to talk about intimacy and how it is conveyed through body language and how this pertains to the themes of motherhood, whatever, in a particular way. The first two pictures, which Indians anyway will recognize, are of the mother and the child sitting close together and the mother seeming to be advising the, fa uh, the son, right? So this is a close, in the dynastic setting, the fathers and sons are close, the, the mothers and sons, mothers and sons are close together. The fathers, remember, have been, have died, right? Have killed. Um, and if you look at this, you look at the distance between the second, on the other side, um, on the right, um, is it right or left? On the left-hand side, what you see is uh, the prime, in, uh, the president of India, shake, uh, meeting Adityanath. The president of India is reaching out his hand. Adityanath is maintaining a distance with his namaste, and there is a clear visual gap between the two. The, I'm saying this to you, I'm studying it, but you could be studying it because we've already talked about ma coupling, right? And how uh, you can, as, as 
sort of members of the public, you can participate in research as people could do earlier. Again, you see the distance between Amitabh Bachchan, who is a very famous actor, and Sidhu. The clear male difference, there is a clear intimacy space in these two pictures. So the gestures or the body language in more detail are telling us something. So, um, just to repeat, this is a repertoire of gesture, not collected by me, but we added to because we found Rahul Gandhi used this a lot and Modi or the older politicians used the embrace gesture a lot. So, and now we come to um, uh, how we analyze. So, I had said in my syst simplest systemics of gesture that um, that three gestures, three or four gestures are predominant because that was that gives individual character to politicians. What we do find is this pattern clearly in both Rahul and Varun Gandhi. We find they use actually similar non-aggressive gestures. So uh, what are the gestures that they use most? Um, we will look at that in more detail. And Varun Gandhi's gestures are those. You can see they are big blocks. And then there are small, small amounts of other gestures. So we find that um, Rahul Gandhi hands together, hand purse, and palm back. Now, if you were an ethnomethodologist, you would not be interpreting this. You would just be presenting it. However, most audiences want to know what do these gestures mean? How do specialists talk about it? Here we come to the meaning of gesture, which is a complex problem which I've studied separately. But in any case, you, one thing that you can see is that three or four gestures predominate in the, these particular politicians. In the case of Rahul Gandhi, they are hands together, hand, purse and palm back. In Varun, thumb and forefinger, palm front and baton. Okay, so what do these gestures mean? This is just for you and me, but I double checked by asking my students to independently code. So, both hands together, cross. So if you take just three gestures, they make up 61% of the gestures of Rahul Gandhi. So what are the gestures? Uh, uh, both hands together clasped. This is supposed to show, and I'm saying supposed to show because we, I, I don't really know. Um, but this is what the so-called experts on gestures say. This is supposed to show that the speaker wants to contain conflict. Both hands together clasped. Uh, common among individuals made anxious by the social secure situation in which they find themselves. 24% if we inter accept this interpretation of Rahul Gandhi's gestures are like this. Hand purse. In the hand purse, the tips of all uh, five digits are brought together until they touch in a tight circle. Um, like the mouth of a string purse. This is usually used to emphasize a particular point. This is the gesture. Palm back. This reflects an attempt to embrace an idea, etc. So thumb and forefinger touch. Uh, palm front. Now what only the raised, among all these gestures, only the raised forefinger gesture is perceived as domineering. And this is used by Varun Gandhi. And when I passed it through my students and I said, look at this data. These are the gestures. What do you think? Are they aggressive? Are they domineering? Just intuitively. They all said, we'll see that, that he's making the raised forefinger gesture, but it doesn't coordinate with what he's saying. And it's very unconvincing. So you can have a week. Um, raised forefinger gesture, but uh, of course uh, what um, Modi or other experienced politicians when they use this, it is much more, uh, has much more punch. Now we know this, how do we know this? It's interpretation through body language, right? It's just general mass agreement. So, so this is what we are finding, that there is gesture preference among individuals. Uh, these are the gestures they don't use. They use a bit, but not much. Uh, 
Now we come back to the Sackshagloff and Jefferson paper. And what we find is they say, they emphasize over and over again is we are not creating the problem. I mean, we are not interested in what we see as problems. We want to see what participants see as problems and we will locate the problem inside the transcript of the talk. Okay, so, is, so that's why you have all this business about repair and uh, turn allocation and floor and coordination and pauses and hesitations and all the rest of it because they are reading into repair and so on some attempt to mitigate, self-mitigate or get um, sort of feedback from others but basically they're reading this as a problem. Now, I think that's interpretation, but the um, um, ethnomethodologist may not agree. So they're reading this as pro a problem for participants, repair and so on and so forth. Now, a possible methodological extension, if you have mass, if you have mass participation in research, is asking ordinary interested parties, in my case graduate students, but it could be my family or anybody else, to impressionistically analyze the videos um, and look at them, assess the videos, given that these are of a political nature, they are meant for all of us. Okay, And so I uh, will talk about my students for a bit now. And So they, I gave them the, inter the gestures and I, we looked at lots and lots of these as we did in the case of Modi. We collected them with us. So there was a research method which we won't go into which was quite <coughs> complicated and I think meant to be robust. So these were all the gestures and uh, these, uh, we finally settled on 60 odd pictures. So this is the students interpreting it. They notice he has no stretched arms. He usually does not try to make his body appear bigger by trying to spread out his arms. So they are saying that when you spread out your arms, your body becomes bigger and this is something they noticed. And they're finding it in uh, you know, other experienced politicians' gestures. Again, I've done this, so I'm not going to repeat what we've done in other senior politician studies. Reaching out to his audience and attempting to convey, Rahul frequently uses the palm jack gesture, so we had given them the categories. These gestures did not appear at all aggressive. So for them, palm back gestures and palm side gestures, this did not appear aggressive uh, and so on. So they said, Tight fist and other aggressive gestures are rare. rare. Rahul also occasionally uses the tight fist gesture when making a toy. We think this was to display his mental vigor and determination. Gestures associated with aggression like the raised finger and the tight fist were in fact used very rarely by him. So this is how people notice things. You know, um, and they, they, you can't erase from intercoders' minds or students' minds previous impressions. So there is a problem with getting, you know, when you're doing, asking people to do interpretations, their ideas already are part of the narrative and this is a theoretical problem. Um, so um, Rahul Gandhi, student reaction to his features they say it was noticed that he does not change his facial expression according to the speech he is delivering. There are random, now if you know IIT students, random is a favorite word which they use. And they say uh, he seems to change his facial, his facial expressions randomly and bit discontinuously. He gives an impression of absent-mindedness, his clasped hands are very noticeable, we had to put them in and this is because of tension. Okay, so uh, speech, hands clasped, uh, etc. Varun Gandhi, right? Gestures relieved, they found Varun Gandhi extremely monotonous. And they said, you know, at least when we looked at the gestures, the monotony was relieved. And he tried to make more aggressive gestures than Rahul. Remember, they, um, they, they are just three gestures which are predominant, and this is very easy to notice in their speeches. And this was a prediction we made from this setting up a systematics for gesture. 
and um, the hands close to the body. So they noted two things among these cousins. Facial expressions were flat. They couldn't really make out much from the facial expressions. And the hands were always close to the body, whether it was a namaste or any other gesture, which is a self-protective gesture. Okay, so um, we watched a total of five videos. They comment on his speeches. English vocabulary. A trend seen in these videos is that in public rallies, they used a lot more English words than uh, experienced politicians. Monotonous. Monotonous, we've already mentioned this. They were slow. So you didn't get excitement. Now you've seen all this, but they noticed it from the gestural coordination, but you might agree. Uh, so uh, he, he, they say, and a gesture is not, according to them, used perfectly. So they try to use an aggressive gesture, but because it doesn't coordinate with the speech, it seems imperfect. So they're looking naturally at speech gesture coordination. Okay. So not aggressive, etc. These are the Rahul and Varun, Varun things, uh, use of English. But this could be, now we look at Adityanath and Sidhu. Okay. Now they are much more colorful as politicians. They use three gestures, predominant, again you can see. And Navjot Singh, three gestures, predominant. What are these gestures? Uh, so, Yogi Adityanath raised forefinger for so this. Now, what we haven't studied is the different hands, but preferred hand raised forefinger, palm front, ruko, and tight fist. These gestures come out as much more aggressive. People can read the gestural language. Navjot Singh Sidhu raised forefinger 32. Remember how low this was in the case of Rahul. Palm front 20. And palm uh, uh, upside 17. You see a difference in the gestural map of these politicians. And even if you don't remember the speech, you will remember the visuals of the body. So uh, then you have doing being ordinary. So uh, what we are finding is, so they are making these gestures and we can see that the dynastic heirs are dressing in black and white. They don't dress in color. The non-dynastic people are dre dress brightly with patkas and so on and so forth. You never see, hardly ever see Rahul, maybe he's doing it more, but hardly wearing the kind of fancy clothing and um, when we looked at the speech right now Rahul was didn't when we we analyzed I think 200 page, I don't know how many pages of Modi speeches because they were so available but when it came to Rahul we were hard put to it to find speeches but what we did find was interviews and that was good for us because we could look at the conversation and um, one of the things we found is that he would question the questioner the questioner here do any of you know Arnab Goswami so he is very very aggressive as a questioner but Rahul and he are talking and Rahul, uh, Rahul Gandhi says the real question is what I am doing sitting here you are a journalist when you were small you must have said to yourself I want to do something you decided to become a journalist at some time why did you do that and Arnab said you are asking me the question I'm supposed to interview you and uh, Rahul Gandhi says, yes, I'm asking you a question. It is a conversation. But, so now you see what he's doing. He's doing being ordinary by saying you and I are similar. You chose a profession, I chose a profession. Is me kya hai? Of course, this has its frame. So <laughs> Arnab says, I can enjoy being a journalist. It's a professional challenge for me. My question is, are you avoiding a direct face-off with Narendra Modi? Rahul Gandhi says, I'm going to answer the question, but I just want to ask you, when you were young and thought of being a journalist, what drove you? So this thing of mitigation is happening. He said, you know, like, you tell me what you were like. 
So this taking over of the interviewer's role, and Rahul Gandhi says at the end, I'll throw the question. So they have the questioning routine thrown back and forth, and Rahul Gandhi says, you are not answering my question, but I will answer the question, and that will give you some uh, insight into now third person reference, how Rahul Gandhi thinks. Okay, so this is where his actual uh, persona is showing up because he is mitigating but he uses third person. He uses lots of denials and hedges. Interviewer says, explain that the government of Gujarat was aiding and abetting the riots is what you just said. Explain that. Arnav Goswami is extremely aggressive. Rahul Gandhi says, I mean it's not me, it's a large number of people who were there. Large number of people, so massification um, of the discourse, who saw the government of Gujarat being involved in the riots. You will keep that line, says Arnav Goswami, despite the CM getting a clean sheet from the courts? Rahul says, I mean, people saw it. I'm not the person who saw it. Your colleagues saw it. Okay, your colleagues told me. So you can see what's happening. This is actually ordinariness uh, construction. And we find that now when we look at the cousins, we, and we did, now we have these other set of tools, which also internet, you can quickly do word counts, you can make these pie charts and do whatever. So what we found is, when we looked at Rahul and Fig, you can look at that, the three most in, we looked at the 10 most important words, uh, recurrent words in their speeches. What we found is people want and think, people want and think for both these were among the top 10. They are extremely vague indexicals, if they are indexicals at all, extremely vague. People wanting, chana, some, you know, and think. Okay, when we come to the other guy's discourse, you'll see how specific they are. So these are like removed from the people. So, um, so here we have um, uh, another thing which uh, Rahul uses is, and both of them use it, Varun. They talk about family tragedy and how this makes suffering is the same whether you are a dynastic heir or you are somebody and I am among the common people, I have been given endurance through my suffering. So suffering becomes a very common uniting theme about ordinariness among the Indian people and the Gandhis. So, uh, so both Rahul and Varun have created national uh, narratives of ordinance through a sim that use a simple menu of words, gestures and dress. However, it is exactly this positioning that seems to inhibit their growth as political beings. Despite their appeals to democracy and people and wanting, they are seen as intrinsically undemocratic owing to the familiar pre-narrative of their birth. So you have pre-narrative frames. The Indian public shows little empathy for their suffering, even though both of them bring up suffering and see them, they, and they often use words like weak, unworthy, etc. So in short, whatever these highly placed cousins belonging to opposing parties do, they both seem caught in a rhetorical bind, a gesture, they are mitigating through gesture, they are doing being ordinary, but they are apparently not succeeding. Now you look at the other guys, Adityanath, I will not stop till I turn UP and India into a Hindu Rashtra, and he's saying this publicly, right? Shah Rukh Khan should remember, and remember the film's nexus between film stars and politicians is quite high, they are high on a visibility scale. Shah Rukh Khan should remember that if a huge mass in society boycotts his films, he will also have to wander on streets like a normal Muslim. I think there is no difference between the language of Shah Rukh Khan and Hafiz Said. So Hafiz Said is a well known, so he is saying these kinds of things which are elements of really polarized discourse, but he's saying them publicly, and the public elected him. Same with Sidhu. So Sidhu says, and Sidhu makes jokes, right? So we have Sidhuisms as a form of discourse. That ball went so high, it could have got an air hostess down with it. Now, Sidhu is forgiven this, but if Rahul Gandhi has said it, he would be in big trouble. 
because he would it would be perceived as gendered as not acceptable all that comes from a cow is not milk okay now you know what you want to interpret so there's a lot of ambiguity you have to interpret it and you have to interpret it within the political frames that we have so Siddhu can do whatever he likes fear multiplies faster than rabbit he does a lot of stuff and he is treated fine so we have an indulgent public for people from an ordinary background even though you know you have mitigating strategies for um, uh, by both these political heirs both uh, both Siddhu and um, uh, Adityanath stress their local rather than national moorings and their own uniqueness not only as political but also as important leaders in other spheres this Rahul and Varun cannot do because all they are all they have is a political frame they don't have this independent standing so now if you look at the top word counts of these two guys what do you get you get Uttar Pradesh uh, in Adityanath and Punjab not people and country and so on Punjab uh, and uh, in Modi we found Gujarat, India was hardly mentioned pre-election compared to Gujarat. Localism is location is the critical and then you have buses. So buses and housing, these are themes on the ground. People want buses in the Punjab, a lot happens around buses drama and houses in Uttar Pradesh and govern and both of them use govern. This is not used by either of those two. So you are seeing stark obvious differences by looking, doing content analysis, doing turn taking, doing gestural analysis and all the rest of it. So, uh, so now finally we have some beginnings of a typology, I am still working on it. There is a clear preference for just three, three to four gestures. Gesture type there is a clear statistical difference in the type of gestures used by politicians with a political pedigree versus those not gesture culture there are culturally specific unique gestures like the namaste and other kinds of body language bending and so on some individuals may display a stance that is not common Ra uh, rahul gandhi uses the hand clasp uh, gesture, speech and coordination, there can be judged judgments of lack of coordination between speech and gesture by audiences leading to inferences of being a papu and so on and so forth. Other, but what we were not able to find is gesture intention. That is, were they specifically doing this because uh, we couldn't judge intentionality. Right now, uh, so we did find evidence uh, for a gestural system which is being and gesture construction units are being used. So one gesture will follow another kind of gesture. So back to sax, we had talked about how sax was talking about the tape recorder as a methodology and he says, when I started to do research in sociology, I figured that sociology may not be an actual science unless it was not a, until, unless it was able to handle the de details of events, handle them formally and in the first instance be um, something about them in the direct ways in which primitive sciences are often formative. So he is really here talking about how you can set up the observational grounds for what he calls a primitive science of speech. And if you look at that Ypres, hmm, whatever, that little thing, quote I gave you from the 2019 Ypres website, it talked about uh, interaction and the science of language use. And I thought about this and I was thinking, you know, is it a science or not? But you can see here that people are thinking that, okay, let's at least have the observational basis for a 
for a scientific observation or an objective observation using ma handheld mass data that is easily uh, um, usable and recording it and finding out whether we can come up with regularities. When I looked at gesture, I thought, how odd that nobody has actually done a systematics of gesture and when I did it I did find the kind of regularities of which Sachs spoke. So this is to say I did not use Western you know Western politicians although I looked at them quite a bit. I used Indian political discourse. I used gestures like the Namaste but I'm still finding preferences. Preferences for hand, right hand versus left hand, preferences for gesture, etc. So we are, we are finding uh, so preference structures. So he says, I, I want to be observe them in direct ways, in, in, in the direct ways in which primitive sciences are often formative. That is, anyone else can go and see whether what has been said has actually been said and that is a tremendous control on seeing actually a control on how we see so he is talking about mass participation mass problem solving as a control on ways of seeing because what he is trying to describe is uh, how we get to have problems in conversation. The question was, he says, could there be some way that sociology could deal with the details of actual events, formally and informally? And he found this way, which was the tape recorder and observing ordinary conversations. So again, he go, to go back to the quote I used at the beginning, the tape recorded materials constitute a good enough record of what was on the tape. It wasn't the best and no record, of, even if 10,000 people recorded, things will be left out. So you have to analyze the data, you have to create a system and then you may be wrong. People might prove you wrong. But that's no, so this notion of making a primitive science by observation is very important in understanding what pragmaticians are trying to do. They are trying to fashion observational tools and self-understanding through this sort of focus. So the work I'm doing on talk, it is about the details of talk, etc. So returning to the idea finally of uncoupling. Following Weizmann and Scherzer, and I had already been thinking about that, so I had a gestural system. So when they came to me with, you know, can I be on that panel? I said, yeah, I think this data fits. <coughs> Following Weizmann and Fetzer, our research also supports the idea that there is now another uncoupling of space and time that enables the construction of ordinariness as a public endeavor in the political sphere. I have also looked at it in other kinds of public spaces, but this is, you know, like a one-hour tour. The genre is political discourse, it, as it is recorded and assimilated by large local and national publics through the new media. So we uh, have uh, put the, uh, these recording devices, put the ability to record gestures and other accompaniments in, directly into the hands of us. Okay, ordinary people and thus seem to reduce the distance between public and private power, between ordinariness and extraordinariness. So Sachs is clearly excited by the tape recorder and I'm ending, I don't know how we are doing for time, but I'm ending this part here and if we have extra time, I will talk a little bit more about theory, uh, intentionality, that sort of thing. If we don't have time, this is one good stopping place. And otherwise, I would talk, I only want to talk about the last two. With the others, I'll give you quotes. So, this is a business about time management. If we have time, we need not do this. We have 15 minutes. Let's take questions. My head is bursting. But this is a very simple talk. Why is your head bursting? There is one question. Can we have questions? Would you like to have Who has questions? Okay. Oh. Yeah, the, I can see the icon, but. 
Okay. So, uh, so uh, this session is not really on. Um, well, it's it's a it's um, sort of pulling together session. So it means that what people have the feedback we've got, people have been saying that you know there are high levels of abstraction. So you're talking about um, whatever it is. Um, uh, things like methodology and you're using all these words and how we should pull it together so this is more of question answer but I'll, I want to focus on two things which is speech act theory implicature and implied meaning and this has come up again and again so we need some grip on what implicature is but before that various big words have sort of littered, uh, uh, so not littered, but <laughs> littered is not the right word, but they have dominated our discourse. So words like truth, I mean, uh, uh, Brooke used it yesterday as, a, as having an implied relationship with fake news. So if there was fake news, there must be real news. So there was an implied or implicational relationship and uh, we understood it, but it's important for us to at least get one sort of fix on what we might mean by truth. Truth is a classic philosopher's chestnut. Everyone discusses truth and I like those discussions which are to do with the logical structure of truth, such as with Tarski, but I know that most people here are not concerned with that kind of truth, but a general idea of what we all understand by truth. It strikes me as pretty ironic, this is deviating from uh, pragmatics, that you know, we used to say about truth that it is negotiable, it is variable, it varies across contexts, you can never be absolutely sure what is truth in a finite, provable <coughs> sense, sense, etc. Now we find with truth in being assailed in the public sphere, that people are saying, well, there are facts, you know, and we are going back to what is essentially a pre-modern position. And to me, it's interesting that we are in this paradox because we had fought for a liberal interpretation of truth. Are you with me? Yes. But we now are in a position where they, damn it, there is truth. So how are we able to look at truth? Now, if we look at... Um, the founders of pragmatic theory, or some of the founders, to the thought, uh, thought patterns of uh, uh, pragmatist theory, we find that uh, there are uh, Darb, there's Austin, Sperber and Wilson, Chomsky, and I'm going to have um, sort of produce quotes from all of them, which we can keep in the back of our minds while we discuss. Uh, a speech act theory and Gricean theory and so on. Gricean theory, because he specifically mentions implicature um, or implied meaning, comes up again and again. And there are many confusions around Grice because he is an analytic philosopher. So you have to know some amount of um, analytic philosophy. So I want to get there, but I'll just put some some quotations in front of you so that we can think about the background of pragmatic theory. So um, I want to uh, sort of look at the notion of theory itself. Now Harrison um, uh, says, and he is again a philosopher of language, not a particularly well-known one, but a pretty robust one. And he said it is widely accepted that the most plausible, now listen, he's using the word plausible, and plausible means probably quite likely to be true, but not definitely true. So he's saying it's widely accepted that the most plausible, perhaps 
the only possible. So you see those modulations in dis uh, discussions on theory in the arena of pragmatics um, and linguistic pragmatics. It is widely accepted that the most plausible, perhaps the only possible alternative to a truth conditional theory of meaning is a theory couched in terms of the beliefs and intentions of speakers and hearers in specific concrete contexts of communication. Now you see all those key words turning up say you know we've had truth conditional semantics for a long time so we all did you know the morning star and the evening star and what constitutes um, a bracketing of truth and th those are important debates if you want to do uh, a kind of Quinean analysis, certainly the sort of classical analysis of Frege. Uh, but if you want to do something more related to the world and the communities we live in and how truth is negotiated, which is what pragmatic theories try to do, then um, we shift ground and our key terms change. Right. So here, this session, since it's question and answer and fairly loose, uh, please ask me, uh, interrupt me, where you're not uh, get, uh, getting what I mean. So he says, on the one hand, there are classical logicians' accounts of meaning based on true, uh, and I can discuss with you three kinds of theories of truth, broadly speaking, what I would call um, uh, the um, uh, consensus theories of truth versus the corroborative theories of truth versus the um, internal consistency theories of truth. Would you like me to do that? You don't want to know about theories of truth. Well, there are theories of truth. We can put them aside because what we are concerned with is negotiated truth. Right? So this is a philosopher saying intentions and beliefs of speakers and situations are what we are looking at when we are thinking of a concept like truth. Many, many people would disagree. Many, many people would disagree because why? Because these terms like intention and belief are very hard to check. Speakers change their negotiating stances, their positionings. We can never really be sure of intentionality. So for example, um, if you look at um, American law, uh, it recognizes that people ha ha tell lies all the time. So politicians are not liable for not telling the truth. It is not what you say, but to whom you say it and where you say it that uh, a culpability is established. So if you tell the truth to, in a, uh, if you don't tell the truth in a court of law, that is where and to whom, to uh, uh, officers of the law, it doesn't matter if you lie. You are not culpable. And that is a recognition of the fact that you know you can't pin down speakers to uh, truth, a truth conditional view of the world because that there would be very little left to say. So we are stuck with the problem that we have quite a, a sort of um, not such a strong and reliable account of truth. So um, um, Austin and Searle suggest that um, the distinguishing feature of uh, language as a species of intentional action in the fact is the fact that it is rule governed and proceed to try and elucidate what the rules are. So we take it for granted that negotiation or the language game of negotiation uh, of, about truth has some rules we try to say what those rules are. As Grice would say, ceteris paribus, all things being equal. So there are people, and I'm going to be talking about Grice as well as speech act theory, who kind of say, look, we are going to try to look at 
the rules. Others say we can never get at the rules. I mean, even if you define sincerity conditions and propositional content conditions and um, other kinds of conditions, you still will never get uh, a truth in a sense that you can hold on to. So, Grai says, let's not get into defining the rules. Let's try to get it. Let's try to get to the norms and let's see what happens when people break them Which means you can test these things you can make make up examples You can look at critical context and you can say okay. We postulate this norm This moral norm and you know it grass follows a pseudo Kantian model that you know Kant said you ought to be so a moral imperative is you ought to behave with others as you would like them to behave with you. This is a this is the set of Kantian a sort of overarching Kantian rules which Grice was imitating when he set up his conditions. So he says we can we can look at we can look at we need we should just have norms, not rules. And um, we should look at what happens when these rules are broken. Okay, uh, and we can look at speakers and intentions, uh, speakers intentions and beliefs, which are often implicit, and therefore the idea of implicit meaning. So um, we want to go to the next slide, and so if you want to look at truth in this very neg as a negotiable uh, concept which is constantly changing grounds and which you can have norms for in various societies and some generalized norms and then you can see what happens when when they are broken you are reduced to in a sense observation you look at instances of when uh, these rules occur and why they occur. So uh, Darwin is I think an important guide and I say this because I'm working on Darwin but one thing that he said which really struck me is how humble he was and this goes to Yanola's notion he talked about responsibility and humility. Well here you are I have no great this is Darwin and you could say much of the world's thought today, the notions of evolution which are foundational owe a great deal to Darwin, although he was not the only one who, found, who thought of this idea. I have no great quickness of apprehension. I don't see things quickly. And my power to follow a long and abstract argument is limited. Okay, so he's saying what we often say, I couldn't understand, it was too abstract, you know. Uh, but I am superior, he says, to the common man in noticing things which easily escape attention and in observing them carefully. So, what did he, he has only observational adequacy, the lowest rank. And from that, because he's observed thick description, he's got such a thick description and he goes off when he's 22 to, um, uh, on this beagle and for years and years he's traveling and then he goes back again and he makes sketches, notes, describing the minutest things he sees among turtles and birds and so on and he's just observing and this thickness of observation gives him and this actually uh, leads us to pragmatic theory where thick description on the ground in a variety of contexts as we said last time is is important to establishing norm a normative notion of truth so that's darwin he is one of my gurus you want to ask because this type of is allowed yes yes it is allowed that's not a rule but in my Lectures, it's a norm. Yes, but I'm saying that pragmatics is a large, baggy, broad church organization. And which of these are, if not Exact methodologically aligned, at least they are not incompatible. 
So Darwin's notion of observation and lots of Chomsky talks about levels of observation which I mentioned in my first lecture. Um, observation is not incompatible with a Gricean account of things. Philosophers typically and linguists like Chomsky make up examples but this is not incompatible with observation. Hmm? It may be incompatible when you come to descriptive adequacy because you may have a different set of uh, different set of descriptions, but it is um, not incompatible as I see it. Now we can discuss whether it is incompatible and how would we say it's not compatible. But I would say, yeah, you know, some pragmatists do thick description, but their thick descriptions can then tie to what Grice says about universal implicature. Okay, so that is that, does that answer your question? Um, so that's on method. What's the method? Observational method. Not even uh, other kinds. Of, which, uh, let's just stick with method, just observing. And anybody can observe, now that we have all those tools, everyone can do lots of observations. Okay, then we have Austin saying, you know, you, and Austin has a quarrel. He's setting up a discussion with other philosophers. Philosophers classically talked in terms of finding out the truth and actually establishing robust truths which cannot be questioned. But in this case, uh, he is saying, you know, look at ordinary people's utterances. So he's going to observation and he's saying, look, you know, most of the time when I say, um, could you please open the door, what's the truth value of that? It's impossible. Questions don't have truth values, right? Only declarative. If you say hello, <coughs> hi, which you do dozens of times a day, what's the truth value? In fact, it's supposed to have empty propositional content. It has no truth value. So he says a lot of the stuff we do in our everyday life, that's his observation, even though he didn't have a tape recorder. His observation is, look, you know, you observe. People are not making statements like the earth is round, which you can falsify or not falsify. They're making statements like, you know, I feel hungry and you can't check the truth of that. It's a, just a statement. So this is the basis of his saying that, you know, move the focus, philosophical focus, away from truth and truth verification claims, which is what Freddie Ayer and all these people were doing. And let's go towards uh, this other notion of truth. And this other notion of truth is a pragmatist notion. Uh, under the heading truth, what we in fact have is not a simple quantity nor a relation. So it's not a relation, it's not a quantity, um, nor indeed any one thing, uh, but rather a whole dimension of criticism. So all those people who are doing critical discourse analysis, here you are. It's a way of criticizing the world around you where you have different competing views of intention and belief and truth. Uh, there is a whole lot of things to be considered and weighed in this dimension alone, dimension of truth, uh, which is only one of the dimensions of conversation. The facts, yes, but also the situation, which today is called situatedness, of the speaker, his purpose in speaking, purpose, intention, uh, questions of precision, how precision do you want to be? When you come to Grice, Grice focuses on precision. You have a question. No? Okay. So this isn't how to do things with words. And because I'm interested in whether gestures have truth value. And we can take a call on this. Um, here's Nietzsche saying, one may sometimes tell a lie, but the grimace we're talking about facial expression, uh, uh, with which one accompanies it tells the truth. So when you're looking, huh? You, you don't. You don't agree. It doesn't happen. I'm just saying that. The I. Yeah. So so there is. 
So, so they, yeah, and you can actually, in the Modi uh, studies, we looked at the dimension where you can, in a way, facially project something and verbally project <laughs> something else. Anyway, so you have a lot of stuff, the stuff which is missing in this question. So, you know, so he's loosened up the description, dis uh, the description of truth to so much that a lot of uh, doors have been opened out into observing truth as negotiated in interaction. And that is, I don't know whether you're familiar with, um, a, you know, the Austinian framework. Please tell me if you aren't. Like, do you know what is an elocution? I mean, there are lots of people who know elocutions, perlocutions, locutions, um, and types of speech act and uptake and so on. How many people don't know this? I don't want to spend too much time. Only one, one, two, three, four. I'll talk to you later on this, you know, perlocutionary effects and so on, and why they are very hard to judge. Uh, but, uh, uh, we oh, we have moved the discussion of truth to the discussion of context. And what kind of context? Intentions and beliefs. So they are internal. So what does this, this leaves you with the problem for speakers that you have to figure out the truth all the time. Because, you know, it's about intentions and beliefs and you can't guess them so you have to use inferential patterns. Hence, Grice's move towards Infer inferring hearers interaction. This is, I'm not saying anything which is unusual. So everything, everything, every bit of tacit knowledge can play a, a part in inferences going right or wrong. And uh, so this, uh, uh, but I want to just put Chomsky in there because I know that when I started um, doing linguistics, I was very impressed by Chomsky's writing. I liked the rigor, the detail, and the clarity of his writing. And it didn't phase me a bit. Rules like alpha C commands beta if the first branching node which dominates alpha also dominates beta, and neither alpha nor beta dominate each other. This was very easy for me because I could see it was a tree structure, and that all he was talking about was sister nodes on a tree. but. What linguists did, which I think was a mistake, is that they never explained that C command is constituent command. So most people didn't know that they were just talking about units of language as outsiders. So I think linguists failed to explain the theory to all of us, and people got bored with syntax. Nevertheless, I was very, very you know, kind of enchanted by the clarity of aspects of the theory of syntax and later syntactic structures. And when I read Chomsky uh, now, and this paper, if you haven't read it, please read it uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but this one is a lovely paper. It's an interdisciplinary paper, if you're interested in it, the Chomsky Hauser at Fitch paper. Do you know anything about Hauser? He was at Harvard. Nothing? So ha he lost his job or was put on permanent suspicion because he had faked his data. OK? So even though he was very fine designer of experiments, he did fake his data. And he was permanently put out of com commission because of that. Nevertheless, this is a very good paper, despite Hauser's fall from glory. OK, so we can talk about it later. So Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. Fitch is a philosopher. So one psychologist, one linguist, and one philosopher. He said, they said, an understanding of the faculty of language requires substantial interdisciplinary cooperation. We suggest how current developments in linguistics can be profitably welded to work in evolutionary biology, anthropology, psychology, and neuroscience. Does not mention any adjoining fields of linguistics, such as pragmatics. But he is aware of them, and it is important that by uh, 
2002, beginning of this century, they are suggesting that linguistics cannot stand alone but needs to expand to understand other aspects of what is happening when intentions and beliefs are being traded. So, but then he says something even more interesting which I find in an interview. It is quite possible, overwhelmingly probable one might guess, again look, probable, possible, may happen, there's a lot of negotiation going on in the academic discourse. It is quite possible, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly po probable one might guess, that we will always learn more about human life and human personality from novels than from scientific psychology. That's Chomsky, right? So when we demonize people, we should be careful because what he's saying is if you want to learn about human beings and whether he believes it or not, he's on record as saying it, that you learn about psychology from novels, which are internal imaginative constructions of the human mind, right? And that's why I think that Linguistics should have his doors open, take in pragmatics, but also literary cr theory and literary criticism. So the science forming capacity is only one facet of our mental endowments. We use it where we can, but we are not restricted to it, fortunately. So we have to realize that you know, here we have responsibility, moral responsibility to look at what people say and negotiate with this. That the doors of language are wide, pragmatics takes in a lot, and so does literary theory, critical theory. So um, now I come to pragmatics and speech acts. Okay. So we know, this I already told you this, J.L. Austin, How to Do Things with Words, Paul Grice, that's the one I'm going to talk about, and Steve Levinson, who, whose book I was very influenced by, even though I didn't read it until very late. Um, so the claim here, what is the claim about speech acts? You already know this, but I'll quickly go through it, because I don't want to talk about speech acts so much, I want to talk about implicature. But I will talk about speech acts. So uh, basically, very simply, illo illocutionary acts are supposed to be the central type of act, but you can have locutionary acts which, you know, go back to Aristotle, that is, you imitate the sound and um, Sent, uh, con sentence construction, but you yourself may not understand the meaning. You may be producing, so I can imitate a Tamil speaker and produce the sentence, but may not have any idea of what it means. A parrot or a tape recorder can mimic um, human speech without understanding it. Okay, this is there in those Chinese box examples and so on and so forth. So there is. Illocutionary acts, there's locutionary acts which do not have intentionality and then there is uh, perlocutionary acts which to my mind are very interesting. They are about the uninten possibly unintentional effects that um, a speech act can have on a um, on a hearer. So um, if you're I say something like um, you know, uh, the water in IIT Gandhinagar is, I've just heard it's poisoned. That might raise alarm signals in your head. It's just a speech act, it's a work of it. But the perlocutionary effect is you may cease drinking wa to drink water and be horrified. So that would be a perlocutionary effect and it may be intended or unintended. It usually has emotional content. Okay, uh, again, not too much time there. This is a dist I want to just make some distinctions. Uh, declarative, I hate learning English. Okay, yeah, it has a speech act verb. Directives, please teach me English. Request to the 
to a person. Directives, questions, commands, all of these come under directives. Commissives, I promise to teach you English. So if it is I promise to teach you English, it's a future act of the speaker. It's a, com uh, it's a commitment to a future act of the speaker to the hearer. But whereas if you have directives, the act is on the part of the, uh, uh, the hearer not the speaker. Exclamatives, you speak wonderful English and representatives, English is spoken by billions of people. Now what's the difference between a representative speech act and a declarative speech act do you think? That's a question to you. I'll give you another example uh, which I was giving somebody <coughs> yesterday. Mm -hmm. I, I think Ahmedabad is the capital of West Bengal versus Ahmedabad is the capital of West Bengal. What's the difference in truth value? I think Ahmedabad is the capital of West Bengal versus Ahmedabad is the capital of West Bengal. Huh? Yes, one is true for sure. That is, uh, it is false. In this case, Ahmedabad is the capital of West Bengal, but it has a truth value and you can say true or false by correspondence theory. You can check against the world, right? But if you say, I think Ahmedabad is the capital of West Bengal, that's what you think. It's called an opaque context and so the truth value of that cannot be extracted. So Austin is also an analytic philosopher. He's making a distinction between two types of statement, one where you cannot extract the truth value and the other where you can. Now, what he's trying to say is we can get this in ordinary speech. What he is saying, not trying to say because he's very articulate, uh, is, um, you know, you, we, and ordinary speakers get this. They get that one has truth value and the other does. They may not be able to explain it in terms of types of speech acts, but they get it. Okay, what uh, is the distinction? So the structure of all speech acts is force. So the force can be the force of a declarative or a commissive or a whatever, you know, um, representative or an exclamative. That's the force. It is the kind of social effect that it has and then there's the proposition here in this is it's about teaching and learning English so it will be English and teaching which will be inside the propositional bracket are you with me yeah so proposition can remain the same and the force can change you have to do a little bit of messing around with some layers of logic but it's very simple you change the force force is what people people are attending to in context, not propositional value, which is about truth conditions. Okay? Force is what people are attending to, insults or whatever, politeness and so on. That's the hypothesis. Now, I'm not saying this is true or false. I'm just saying this was the debate. Okay, now we come to Grice on implied meaning. So with Grice, yeah, you have a question. Short question, huh? So, uh, sentence like uh, Einstein was a sociologist. Einstein was a sociologist. False. Okay. Yeah, but but I'm you. Huh. Like, no, Einstein as a sociologist. Is it? Uh, it has truth value. It has truth value because it's a declarative sentence, but you can negotiate the truth value. In other words, in Gracian theory, you can persuade somebody that Einstein was in fact a sociologist rather than what we have always believed, first a scientist. So this is why truth is not a fixed quantity or relation in this theory. So. You can say, it's probably false, you've got it wrong, but you can convince somebody okay. that Einstein was a sociologist. Uh, Austin. Austin says, the two layer sentence has, the construction has two layers. First, is, first layer is whether the statement is meaningful or meaningless. 
Yes. No, so let me let me. I I read Austin. So you no. The last second layer. Whether the statement, the meaning has truth value or not, and that is definition. When the truth value can be constructed, every sentence has the structure of truth value. When the actually the the theory that that is also given by the Chomsky actually. The when it is a subject predicate, when a predicate takes. Subject, then it has oh, so what you are saying is the propositional value no, contains no, 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 a subject no, 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 and a predicate. That, yes, that, it that, does. I will not go to that point. The question is the truth value actually, the sentence. <coughs> Einstein was sociologist. It has meaning. The sentence has meaning, but sentence does not have truth value. Scientist, uh, uh, the, the Einstein was not sociologist. Is the you can say the You know, physics or you can say the scientist, not a sociologist. No, there is no truth. Truth is, it has meaning. It has meaning. It is not. Suppose. Uh, <laughs> All right, we'll get into this. Let's look at implied yes, meaning. We'll come back. All right. Any proper? Yeah. So it has meaning, but not truth. That's something Wittgenstein said. I don't know that Austin said things are. He talked about etiolated meanings, which means meanings which were uh, not fully expanded. He talks about meanings, uh, no propositions like expressives, which don't have propositional content and therefore could be called meaningless, but are obviously not meaningless in terms of force so he is separating out the notion of meaning into truth conditions which can be verified which consists of an argument and a predicate and various other things and various kinds of bracketing which i'm not going into that's inside the propositional bracket then you have something like force and what he is breaking down in his speech act conditions along with Searle is the structure of force that is um, sincerity conditions, propositional content conditions, um, existential conditions and so on. So there is four or five which actually Perel Searle did. He systematized it for Austin but he took Austin's notion of the performative and this is important for people who want to look at performance that Austin was talking in terms of performatives what kind of performatives speech act performatives which have a force so uh, the meaning was in a sense bracketed and what you were concentrating on as an analyst was the notion of force. Now this doesn't mean that everything is meaningless or everything is meaningful, it just means that that part of it could be discussed and you could persuade each other. Okay, I want to get to um, Dreis because after you want to have another question. Hmm. I think that Ahmedabad is capital of uh, Gujarat. This is a this is not a represent a representational uh, feature. He, yes, it's a declarative. Yeah, but if I use, I know that Ahmedabad is capital. Oh, the same. We'll come to this. No versus. Um, I think right. There are different degrees of modality or certainty on the part of the speaker. Right? So uh, we'll come to that. But I just want to make one point about Grice in terms of the discussion we had yesterday. Um, somebody laid out the maxims of quality, quantity, relation, and manner. Would you like me to give you examples of each, or would, can you look them up yourselves? You can look it up yourself. But if you want, I'll give you examples. So, for example, um, if you say relevance, right? How many fingers do I have? On the, you know, you can say five or you can say purple, you can say anything. <coughs> but if you say purple, you have certainly uh, broken the principle of relevance, right? I say in quantity of Grice's examples, can you tell me the way to the canteen? I can, not enough knowledge. You take three steps outside the door, then you look to the right and the left, then you go 50 steps, then you will see a brown door on your left, then turn so and so. That is too prolix, too much information. So those kinds and relevance, Berber and Wilson have talked a lot about the theory of relevance, so you can read that text. But the point I want to make today is that Christ went 
quite a bit further. He didn't just talk about speaker's meaning and literal me uh, speaker and utterer's meaning. Um, uh, he didn't talk about um, no, um, utterance meaning and sentence meaning. He didn't just talk about literal meaning and um, uh, the uh, hearer meaning, but he, oh, uh, oh, sorry, meaning and non natural meaning, which is the derived meaning. He said something else which I think we should focus on if we are interested in pragmatic. He said that. Uh, uh, for the hearer to be able to calculate, that is to be able to infer the implicature Q, hearer must know or believe he knows the following. And what he is doing in G1 to 5 is defining context very precisely. So if you want to look at this, you can look at these. The conventional content of the sentence P uttered. So you must know literal meaning. You must have a hang on literal meaning. You must know the cooperative principle. So a child who has not mastered the cooperative principle cannot necessarily make the right inferences. So you must know the cooperative principle. That's the thing people focus on, the maxims. But in fact he said all these other things in logic and conversation. But people don't read the whole article so you should read it the context of p so other people then go on and talk about context what's there under context so this other debate was moving forward then certain bits of background information this is what we call tacit knowledge and it's extremely difficult to put into computers or robots because we gather, we are just, we have thousands of pieces of background information and tacit knowledge and this is where I think cultural knowledge comes in. And then you require a fail-safe condition that G1 to G4 are mutual knowledge shared. So I can't have one set of um, uh, you know, bits of tacit knowledge in my head and you another. So he is tightening up the notion of what people say, four maxims and then these are violations of the maxims and when they are flouted you get additional effects. Sure, he does say that, but he says something else and that is that all this is required for a good and rich inferential environment. So I would pay attention to this and I would also say that for me G4 is the very important thing and I'll just give you an illustration. So, um, within the Gricean perspective, communication is achieved either directly through compliance with the maxims, that is you follow all the maxims and the cooperative condition and then you don't get, you don't get implied meaning. If you break them, you generate implied meaning but you would, for inference to take place, you need all those G1 to G5 conditions to operate. Uh, so I want to add one thing to the Gricean arsenal, but before I do that, let me, um, Austin has a lot of institutional examples, but let me give you one uh, which, I, uh, which is an ordinary one. Supposing we are in an institution, say you are in a department where you meet every Tuesday, right? And this is common knowledge or mutual knowledge among members of the department. And there is a problem for the speakers, for example, uh, some problem about the canteen has not been sorted out. So you say, Acha Chordo, let's discuss it next week. Now, and everybody leaves the room. Next week is vague, it covers seven days. But because you are in an institutional context, you know that next week actually refers to one day of the week, which is Tuesday. You only know that because you belong within the institution. You don't know that if you belong outside. So literal meaning there won't do. Tacit knowledge, institutional background and 
even if it's trivial, if you need all those G1 to G8 for you to work out the full meaning of the utterance. Okay, so that's a simple everyday example where next week is interpreted as next Tuesday by insiders but not by outsiders, right? And with me, you know, you can think of these examples, but good thing is you can also find them in real life and see whether culture makes a difference. Right, and you often, I've often found it does. So I wanted, I said, yeah, this is fine. And lots of people said, like Eleanor Oakes um, uh, criticized, and I think Bambi Sheeflin too, criticized the Gricean framework of universal implicature, saying that, you know, you have to move beyond generalized uh, conversational implicature because you have all these bits of tacit knowledge which belongs only to particular institutions, particular cultures, particular thing. So you need to add something. And uh, Shiflin and Oak showed many examples of uh, the culture that they were investigating, I forget what it was, where these Gricean norms did not obtain. I'm suggesting that we need a principle and that principle just you know, because I like playing with words, I am calling the principle of impliculture. Not implicature, but implicculture. And these uh, can be done differently in different societies. So here I come to a bit of my own work. And um, I, now we have to ask the question, so what do we get from the idea of impliculture? Is it just a nice word or do you want to say something through this? And I want to say three things we might get from a notion of impliculture, which cultural insiders understand and evaluate, but cultural outsiders may not may not be able to, either institutionally or across large cultures such as you know, the Indian and the Indonesian or whatever. So one is cultural specificities. So we know specifically maybe uh, here that we were t discussing this example that you should use your right hand to eat. This is a strong preference. Okay. And if people don't know that, they will be breaking the specific need of a culture and that's of course arbitrary in the Chomskyan sense. It's variable and many people won't know it. So you can get smaller and smaller cultural groups where this is the rule. In families you may have particular ways of where people sit on a table. Okay? These are things, <laughs> these are specificities and they can be very very specific and politeness involves supposing a stranger comes and sits on your father's chair. You know, this is not done in the family, but you're not going to tell the stranger because he doesn't know the rule, right? It's a family rule. So you have very small specificities and you can think of many of these examples from your own environment. So we begin to orient in our notions of truth and inference towards cultural specificities. We have to do this for ourselves in various cultural groups because after all, <coughs> culture is not the same. So I don't know, so specificity is one thing. These details of where we sit, which hand we use, how we look, for example, gaze, in some, uh, we were talking about presence, like in this, on our first session, I remember, we said, uh, like in certain cultures, it's polite to open your pre present when you're given. The thing. In some cultures you don't open your present, you keep it aside and you only go and open it in private. And this is true, you know, it's true of even things like Steve says, urinating and so on. There are specific cultural conventions which you may or may not know. So that's specificity and it's not even a deep notion. Right? You want to ask a question, Deepthi? Hmm. Yeah, so impli is when you understand, you have enough of those five elements, especially G4, tacit knowledge, to be able to fully get the inference of what the speaker is saying. Uh, so if the speaker is saying, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice if X, uh, the stranger who's come to your house, actually moved to the other place? That's an implied utterance, right? 
I wouldn't, he's saying to the stranger, wouldn't you be more comfortable if you sat there? That is impliculture. Yeah. So that's one. But you have, I have three. So, and that's the most shallow one. And then there are lots and lots of things which we never say. That's the area of taboo. What you can say or not say in any culture varies a lot. So things left unsaid are a very good test of what you take for granted. So you don't say certain things. And uh, very often we don't have a very nuanced understanding of what you should say and what you shouldn't say. What it is correct for you to say as a woman, say in a particular culture or whatever. And that unsaid bundle is like dark matter. There's a lot of it. And that is very hard to program in a computer because there's so much unsaid knowledge and we don't know where to put it. Human beings are the very good at dealing with unsaid knowledge. They've just inferred what mustn't be done from what is done. Right? They've just followed a normative norm, a Grisian norm, and they've got to what you shouldn't be saying. Now they may be wrong, but they just don't say it. So this holds for honorifics, for etc. And the third thing is um, the community as a holistic meme sharing group. So bonding. You establish that you keep out freeloaders and you establish that you are a member of the same community by behaving in certain ways. And there you become, so this is a multi-party conversation. As soon as you have a community, you have polyphony, you don't have a dyad, but you have hundreds of complex dyads. In India where we say we are an interruptive culture, or I say that, uh, what it means is we, you know, we have a polyphonic conversation where the part listening, part not listening, relying on tacit knowledge to make maybe incomplete inferences. So I would say that we do need something, maybe not my notion, but you do need a notion of uh, something which is non-universal in the inference making structure. So generalized, uh, so for example, let me give you an example of generalized Gricean implica implicature. So generalized Gricean implicature is something, have you heard from uh, uh, X, uh, have you heard from Rukmini after she left uh, um, Delhi? say this conversation is taking place in some other part of the world. And the answer is, well, Delhi is a long way from Stanford, you know. What is your inference? Two people are speaking in Stanford. They are saying, have you heard from Rukmini after she left Stanford? Is the in and the answer is, well, Delhi is a long way from Stanford, you know. Has the person heard from Rukmini or not? No. Everybody gets the same answer, that's generalized cultural implicature, right? But if they have a running gag in that institution about never hearing from Rukmini, then that would become an inside tacit knowledge based on other types of knowledge which the two speakers have, okay? So there is, we need something and many people have said this so I'm not the first one I'm just suggesting a term where you have space for local conjectures or impl uh, impliculture so I would like to say that we need generalized implied meaning is always being created it is part of our everyday understanding of what truth is and we can change our positions on the truth, but we do need to augment generalized uh, implicature of the Gricean type, which is extremely powerful. And this is not new, but I want to emphasize it for Indian scholars of Grice. Um, so this, I've already said this. Yeah. You want me to go up to G1 to G5? Huh? Hmm. Yeah, because uh, you remember what Sperber, what Sperber and Wilson said about psychological context. 
Hmm. So, psychological context will differ from speak every individual to every individual. So, the tacit knowledge will not be exactly the same for all speakers, right? So, in other words, G4 may be different from the context, however you want to define context, but there might be an immediate physical context. So, you can see if somebody says shut the door and there is no door in the room, then that means that an existential presupposition has been broken and that would be part of the context. But that's when it comes to background information, this must be shared to some extent, but cannot all cannot be completely shared. So, you have two sets of contexts which will not be the same. So, I think he is trying to differentiate the speaker's context and the hearer's context and saying that, you know, some parts of the context, physical, uh, linguistic, emotional will be shared. Tacit knowledge may or may not be shared. Maybe sh not, it's not the same, it's not for him anyway, it's not the same, context is not the same as tacit information. With Berber and Wilson, I think they're putting it context and mutual knowledge and everything together into one big psychological context because they want only one principle, relevance. So where Grice has separated it out, they put it into a big bundle. Okay? Does that answer your question? So. So, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. What I, what I want to uh, argue is that if we want to develop a concept of implicature, implicature as well as impliculture, these two parallel tracks, impliculture requires very much that we look within and within, within lots of communities and look at what constitutes tacit knowledge and of course we can set up experiments, very nice experiments for testing tacit knowledge. So we could do that and this is an area which, which is under, you know, uh, not mined as much as it should be. So here we can do work which is Indian or Belgian or whatever it is and look at what constitutes tacit knowledge and polyphony. Like, for example, if um, I am in England and several English people are having a conversation and I want to enter the conversation, but I'm not confident because I don't know what tacit assumptions they share, even though we are all professors. So I'm quieter and not able to intervene in the conversation. Whereas in India, I'm frequently cutting in to other people. I mean, I'm very confident about my power over my environment. So our conversational strategies actually differ according to how we ourselves assess our own tacit knowledge, what we have. And so we could do studies in the area, which could be experimental and otherwise, in this sort of implicultural field. Universal Gricean implicatures work a lot of the time and we need them too. So we need to look at two different things. Yeah. It's very vague, abstract thought, but I'm quite excited by it. So I'm just putting it out. I don't know if it's correct, not correct, anything. But one is shared knowledge. But just the what you just said is our own assessment of the you know of the knowledge we have and our own That is called self reflexivity yeah. also. Yes. And our own assessment of what is shared between the speaker and the yeah. So we so keep. These could be very different. They could be. And that is why, under the heading truth, we have something which is very negotiable. This is why all the pragmatists, you know, you can study things like conversation, like the, I did in the first part. But then you can critique it in a broader context by saying, you know, are these norms really universal of conversational structure or of gestural system? How do they differ? Can we say that one of them is completely odd? And, you know, people who study cultural difference insist. And, you know, I didn't have time for this lecture, but I have made a list of people like Steve and so on who talk about. So Steve has gone from saying, you know, there are no universals. To saying, yes, there are cultural universals like Dyxis, but they work very different from culture to culture, so that what is recognized as Dyxis in one culture would not be dyectic. And he's looking at linguistic 
tiny tiny linguistic differences when he is doing that. So even if you have let's say a universal, a pragmatic, a pragmatic universal like Dykes's, you might have such a range of actual dialectic markers and their word order in a sentence, where they occur, how they occur, that you could say, you know, really, you can't have a universal notion of dialectics, even though you have dialectics in every culture, broadly speaking. So, thus, this emphasis on the fact that you cannot have anything which you're absolutely sure about leads to fundamental questions like, who am I? You know, what is my, this? do I know I exist? How do I exist? What validates my existence? Those kinds of questions, which are philosophical questions, are central to visualizing yourself as a being who has notions of truth and falsity. It's not that we are giving up on notions of truth, but we are saying, oh, well, I'm always willing to be convinced that my truth is different, my metaphors are different, uh, my ways of thought, I, I, I've heard people say to each other, I just can't think like you. I don't know how you think like this. You know, so people do differ, they recognize foundational differences, but they don't, so when we cease to talk, pragmatists talk a lot about talk, we cease to talk, we give up on one of the ways of categorizing the world. Uh, so that's that's the argument. Now, I, you know, uh, what, what we say is we are talking about in one hour, talking about all this stuff. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm willing to say I'm wrong on this. You know, that maybe I haven't got it, but I, roughly I would say, yeah, you need to be able to separate out different notions of context, of so-called universals, and even pragmatic universals. Okay, which are not Chomskyan universals of innateness and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sentence structure. And I think there are universals of sentence structure, but we won't go into that. So, uh, so I want to say that we need this. And then I want to move it back to the discussion of gesture that we were having. Now, what we say about gesture, I haven't got those slides here, but uh, uh, you know what we say about gesture, so gesture and embodiment is what I want to talk about. So we can say roughly speaking that there are certain types of grammatical structure. We as human beings we are primed for grammatical structure etc. Can we say that there is a certain element of universal implicature in, in gestures and in the same way as there are for words, types of speech, or can we say that this is not the case because gestures are not a language? Where do you stand on this? Are gestures a language? And is there some universal implicativeness? Suppose I go like this. Is it seen as a violent gesture across cultures? Or is it not seen as a violent gesture? Could we say it's cultural, this? Or is it kind of universal people recognize it as threatening to survival? We don't know the answers to questions like this because we haven't done large cross-cultural studies. But we can begin to ask, is there a systematics of gesture, something we all recognize in terms of many kinds of power differential? I don't know the answer, but this doesn't mean that we, if we can have a systematics of talk, we can certainly begin to ask questions about do gestures imply things? If they are come, so supposing you are saying this and then holding the baby in the next minute, if you have contradictory syntax in gestures, do you give a child different kinds of clues? So you can ask lots of questions about whether gestures. And you know, um, uh, something I was reading the other day in Piaget, I find reading Piaget very difficult because Piaget is badly translated and not available, but Piaget said language is a secondary signaling system. Okay, something like that. So what is the first signaling system? Hmm? Bo the body. The body is the first signaling system and the second signaling system is language. Um, 
uh, different species have very communicative control, you know, there's 16 design features of language. But um, the first signaling system is the body and therefore, and the second signaling system is language, which is extremely complex and difficult. The first signaling system you can always use, desperation, you know, you're drowning, you lift your hand. So, you can't be heard, you're not within earshot, so you can't use language. So, you know, the first signaling system is an important signaling system and it's a signaling system that language is as well <coughs> and much else. So the question is, um, could you could you think of gestures and uh, the body as constituting the primary grid for understanding the world? So this is a thing we could think about. It's a basic question. I don't pretend to have the answer, but certainly we can ask whether there is a systematic suggestion. When you look at dancers and so on, they say, no, you don't have it. I want to go back to postcolonial theory because I was talking about this. Um, so, Edward Said, whose book I mentioned on the first day as starting the postcolonial moment in, institutionally, says there thus there was and is a linguistic orient. He's talking, orient means the east, right? Uh, a Freudian Orient, a Splenglerian Orient, a historical cyclical Orient, a Darwinian Orient, and a racist Orient, and so on. So again, he's talking about having a sphere, which is called the Orient, a cultural sphere, and then saying, you know, you can read many kinds of Orient into the idea of Orient. And postcolonial theory is about the Orient and how to understand its implications, if you like. Um, and what are the presuppositions? I haven't discussed presuppositions, entailments, and um, uh, what is the third one? Implicatures. I have discussed implicatures, but not entailments, which are the true sentences which fall out of any one true sentence. So I'll explain that if you want. Um, and so this notion that there is a Darwinian Orient, what could it mean? What do you think the, what do you think a Darwinian Orient is? We'll be talking about Darwin and his observation. So if, if Darwinian Orient can be negotiated, what do you think? There's a linguistic Orient, which is the different languages spoken in the Orient. And the concept orient, that is the baggy concept orient is made up according to Said of all these other, of all these things and in his writing he was trying to decide like, you know, which of these orients holds power? Uh, how is it negotiated? So this is where I think post-colonial theory does have a boundary with negotiations of what constitutes truth within a <laughs> kind of pragmatic theory, which is not an absolute truth. So I, here I want to go to the Darwinian Orient. Okay, so Darwin did something interesting. First of all, he wrote this book. And this is another book which I think you should read because everybody knows the origin of the species. Have you come, have, how many of you had heard of this book? And how many of you have read it? You've read it. Uh, is that Nishant? Yeah. So, what did you think of it? Really, really impressed. I mean, I read it back in graduate school, but yeah, I think it's a very some some things are quite odd. Yeah, it is. I mean, Ekman at Berkeley has made a beautiful edition of it with annotations, so it's much easier to read now than when I first saw that book. But. Um, it's, I was very surprised that Darwin had written this fat book, uh, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And what was interesting to me is that he used a particular methodology which linguists, at least in this psychological domain and anthropology, uh, the domains of anthropological linguistics and so on use, he used the questionnaire. And he used a cross-cultural questionnaire. So he, he circulated. I want to mention this because in post-colonial theory anyway, we talk about uh, what is, uh, what 
does X mean? If we look at the colonial archive, how can we get intentionality out of a historical archive? Should we even be trying for this? Every sentence in the world has implications. Of course, you do have somebody mention this, the problem of infinite regress, that you can have a sentence like once upon a time there lived a king and you can have infinite numbers of inference from it, but you usually stop at a certain level of inference, but you do not stop making inferences. You just make some inferences. So he circulated this thing because he wanted to infer whether there was in fact commonality across cultures in gestural behavior. That was his. He wanted to ask, in fact, is there a universal language of gesture? Which is the question I'm asking, but with a very different orientation. He sent a list of questions. He made a questionnaire to missionaries and also he sent them to what were then 34 countries and now are 30 countries. These questions concern the use made of the body and facial expressions in different cultures. <laughs> Darwin's hypothesis, as researchers we must always have hypotheses, however crazy our hypotheses might seem, that there was likely to be a basic set of underlying expressions of the emotions that would be invariant across cultures. In other words, he is saying there are universal expressions or gestures across cultures. In other words, he's being a Gracian with regard to normative values in culture. Moreover, he said, this repertoire of emotions would have some emotions necessary to survival, um, that is fear, aggression, and trust. At least these, perhaps more, and you know there are about, I don't know, we've made films on 20 basic emotions and there must be hundreds. So there are hundreds, which would be common across species. So he's not looking at only across cultures, but across species. He wants to say aggression will be common between dogs, foxes, and human beings. These were Darwin's pictures. Okay, So he said that whatever they, this is a man with Duchenne syndrome. So his muscles of his face are fixed. And Darwin was talking to doctors, of actors, all sorts of people because he was so interested in this problem of expression, gestural and facial. So he says this one, you can read many things into it. He read a kind of surprised uh, sort of uh, expression, a smile, and he said, but many people guess that this was not a natural expression, whether they knew the man was suffering from Duchenne's or not. Do you agree? Right? On the left, he said, that is a happy, happy expression. Do you agree? Okay, so we are, when I say, do you agree, I'm leading, this is a leading question. Uh, so I didn't obviously give this sort of question. I said, I'll show you what I did. I can't show you here because I didn't manage to tie my um, uh, PowerPoints up. He looked at actors. Fear, sad, um, and what is the last one? Insulted. Yeah, insulted. So he's looking at actors, like he's not only looking at natural expressions, he's saying how natural expressions can be mimicked and you know, then asking people to judge. So he, this he's doing in his own society, but we'll come to his questionnaire. So, um, and then disdain. Scorn. So he's very keen that this is a good high Victorian expression, disdain and scorn. We found it very difficult. Contempt was one of our hardest expressions to film and to put labels on in India. And uh, disgust. Okay, so do you agree with the disgust expression? Yeah? So you can see Darwin is actually concerned. He's doing this in his own society, but that's not good enough for him. So he looks at chimps closeness and intimacy, whether they're sitting close together or not, or whatever they're doing. And, you know, very hard for him to do this, but he's doing it. Yeah? Because photography was very expensive. And his uh, publisher said to him, why don't you just use sketches? And he said, no, I want photographs. In other words, technology is important as a recording device for him. And um, 
Then he asked these questions and he sent them to all these countries, including India, Kolkata. He said, is astonishment expressed by the eyes and mouth being open wide and by the eyebrows being raised? So he's actually taking a stereotypic expression and then transmitting it across cultures and saying, is this expression there in your culture? So, and people can differ. And they do differ. So he sends this thing all across. He's using a technique which we still use, which is a questionnaire. He is trying to do a cross-cultural study and he's focusing on gesture because, like Pavlov, he believed, I think, that language is a secondary system. The first system is the body and you will see these expressions conveyed in the body. Okay, so you can see his reasoning, but what's interesting is that he is not satisfied with having written Origin of the Species. He is looking at cultural context and trying to decide it. My studies have to do with how Rasa theory, one of my set, one set of studies, uh, Rasa theory, which you will be familiar with, right? Do you know what Rasa theory is? Uh, describes the emotions and how to, and there's a huge difference but I won't go into that I'm just saying so when a man is indignant or defiant does he frown hold his body and head erect and square his shoulders and clench his fist now when I'm looking at my political discourse I say yeah they have clenched fists so you know so there's Darwin and he's talking does he clench his fist does he hold his shoulders back does he show indignation like this. So this is a man who is thinking about whether there are commonalities across species and cultures. Now you can tell Darwin, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? He tried and he used the technology and I think we would all do well if we could learn just to try a little bit. So. Uh, low spirits, good spirits, etc. Now this afternoon, if we have the time, we are going to analyze one of my films. We have 20 and that's on hate speech. And uh, I will tell you why I consider that important. Darwin's 16 questions, which included yes and no, did not include, did not include love or hate. Why? When we did field studies and we said, you know, what do you consider a basic emotion? They would say love. And I say, what else? Hate. <laughs> Darwin did not include love or hate in his 60, in his questionnaire. Why? You don't think this is an interesting question? Why? Single word for love. No, there are many words, yeah, but one, there are some more common ones like pyar and ishq and so on. Of course, there are thousands of words for love. I, I said we don't have, we don't say I love you in. Oh, we don't say it because that's tacit knowledge, I, right? I, Same with a Gracian norm. Translated as an express, expression like, huh, it's meant of the pyar. But the two have a good time. I said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I don't know, it doesn't sound right. But anyway, that was not Darwin's reason. Remember, he's not studying words, he's studying expressions. Take these are uh, common across species, so species may not have language, but they have certain emotions. Why is he not including what to us is primary love and hate? Because they are really does love and hate show on the face? So what he said was, these are long, dura long duration emotions. They last across time, but a surprise is immediate. Disgust is immediate. You see them in the facial expression immediately. But if you love somebody, you don't love them for one minute. You love them across a span of time. The expressions change. He said, I have no way of covering this. When I was doing the films, I thought, well, let it, the more complex an emotion is, like love, the more it is likely to be verbalized. So people are likely to use language for the complex emotions and for emotions like surprise or disgust, they're likely to show it on the face. What about love? 
they are low spirit uh, so uh, low sad melancholia, melancholia but he is also looking at children so uh, uh, things like uh, among the basic emotions according to the psychologist is sadness yeah. and uh, also um, sadness is low spirits and happiness is high spirits and Darwin said you can see that on the face according to Darwin okay anyway so he made his questionnaire and I'm always interested in how questionnaires come up in people's minds because they show an internal working anyway this is to talk about whether there are universal normative uh, structures of gesture whether some part of this is universal and some part like the namaste may be cultural okay so uh, interpretation would differ on whether it was a universal or implicature or an implicature. He then had all these, I don't know whether you can see this. Just one thing, which is totally anecdotal, but terribly, I think somewhat important, which is that Darwin was We don't know, but he no, was very good at tabulating. But in fact, you could say that the institutional uh, arrangement exactly. of a public postal service that was reliable <laughs> was in fact a technical. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, that's a good institutional point. And so was the institution of empire. It was yeah, very critical yeah. for him to get person. all this knowledge because he could, you know, tap somebody in Papua New Guinea and, yes, you know, he India. Assume on it having, he could assume the same reliable person. That's system. right. And it's very important that you had, that's what I'm saying. So you had all these cultural structures uh, embedded within each other. Yeah. One could never really take scientific stuff. On the pole, yeah. From the bigger historical That's right. No, it is true. It's true you that. Know, I, I, mean, I got a very, very, very um, down to earth um, brain that works on imagery. So, when you're talking about this, I'm standing there in that. I, I never forget it. You know, we talked about I never forget the place what it looks like. I'm standing in that hallway. You, know, you had to, to understand Darwin. I always felt that that's been to Darwin or bring up the pictures that are available because it's quite a small house, you know, so there's this mm. part, and then we did study, which the kids weren't allowed to enter. And, and, you know, there's the postman coming again. I'm sure one of the children run, ran to the door or the maid had to go and get the post and then you have to stack it up and over in the meantime. And I'm wondering, you see, because this is one thing to do <coughs> Are the questions varying over time? Do they vary as he discovers no. what one country does versus another? No, and that is because he got so much data and he was a very good tabulator. Okay. So he arranged things very systematically the minute he got it. He, today he would have put them into his computer, you know. He's very systematic, a very systematic man. And that's why, you know, even with his other studies, there's lots of pigeonholes in his mind. And anyway, so I, I know that we are short of time, right? Did he get 
instructions for the respondents to fill like how to like what to no it was he didn't give to he gave very minimal instruction and i think that was really actually quite interesting because yeah, yeah. people again read the implications in their own way and they sometimes added comments like when i show you the films <laughs> they, 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 the natives are lazy and they are a bit like plants and they had their own comments about which also was part of the frame but it was very interesting that they did respond i mean this the india one was sent i pursued that one i haven't been able to do i don't have the money to do i did the big studies you know the developmental ones and so but i couldn't like go off to australia and find out what happened to david's question at there they, so okay so okay you australia Mm, the Australia is there. So this is just um, so he does the West, that is, but the Western world first, and he's talking about yes and no. And uh, to me, it's interesting that he thought yes and no was part of a emotional repertoire, but he did. And I think yes and no should be wor is worth studying even now how yes and no are implied in cultures. And he so he looks at and he says um, in the West the rocking of the skull forward and back yes 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 hmm. uh, upon uh, upon the whatever it is what Condi what does it say uh, whatever which I think I may have made a mistake which rests on the atlas vertebrae no. Then he describes it. Northern Japan, the Senang, the Abyssinians, the Daeks, the Maori, the Sicilians, and I've included, there's, it's a very long list, okay. Calcutta, Bengali. R rocks head rapidly, uh, shoulder to shoulder, four times. <laughs> well, does the Calcutta, Bengali any longer do this? Probably not, but we can test. So we have Darwin's. I uh, think, and we have this, now we can make our questionnaires. So it's interesting for us, and we made a film on yes and no, where we told the, where we had children, and we told them, don't talk in answer to the question, just say yes and no. They found it incredibly difficult, because once you have speech, gesture is relegated, and it's very difficult not to speak. So they almost had to do this in order to answer yes or no and this happens in court people say answer yes or no but people can't resist the impulse to amplify yes and no and darwin included it i think among the emotions because it's a very every many 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 cultures i don't know all have a gestural system for yes and no apart from a linguistic system. One minute, and just one minute. And uh, he thought of them, yes, as a positive emotion, and no, as a negative emotion. Tending to words, implying negativity or a feeling on the part of the speaker, or implying positivity or a feeling on the part of the speaker. So he is thinking of yes and no, and to me that was interesting, because we wouldn't say yes and no are emotions. But he did think it's very strong gesturally, maybe it has an emotional component. Right? Now, Deepthi. I just want to ask, in the film you made, gesture accompanies our verbal language. So Always, according to me, as I said in the morning. I'm just trying to understand. When we tell the children not to speak, the data we collect becomes less natural, right? Yes, so we are concentrating on gesture. So but then that's not the way they would have. Deepthi, we've had this argument again and again. Let me say, I don't think any system is natural and spontaneous. We had this discussion yesterday. I think you begin to be accultured from very early on. There are elements of spontaneity, there, uh, but it's very difficult when you enter a cultural system to retain spontaneous, and this is what we found in our studies, to retain a spontaneous child of nature reaction to the world, which is what Darwin thought, but we are not finding this that result. People are not, they are highly, deeply accultured. And so, you know, suppressing spontaneity, that, I mean, people said that about tape recorders. If you put a tape recorder there, people will forget, uh, you know, will 
will not react spontaneously, but people forget the tape recorder. <laughs> they are much more interested in speaking. So in general, it's a natural impulse to speak, but how you school it, that is politeness, etc., those are not, um, those are not non spontaneous. I don't, I mean, I disagree with you, but we can continue to argue about whether you can get the truly spontaneous gesture. It, you can get towards spontaneity, probably, as the theorists say, but not more. Anyway, just to get quickly to the end of this, this is Darwin. So, um, so I, what I did is, I tried to put it in, so voice, yes, no, uh, face work, this is body language and context. All these things Darwin tried to record. You know, um, sort of, is it face threatening, is it not, and so on. Uh, and then you had like laughter. He said in different societies it is used in different ways to express surprise, wonder, anger in different ways, disgust and contempt among different societies. It's shown in different ways and so on. And if now we imagine an encounter between India, some Indian sage and Darwin, then you might, if this is imagining, so now we are in the literary terrain. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I, this, this slide didn't work. And we just look at Rasa theory, where, you know, Rasa, uh, this Natya Shastra is supposed to be not an original Ved. You know this? Okay, so it was produced and it's in a question answer Socratic format. And uh, the students asked the teacher, uh, um, the uh, originator of the Natya Shastra, Oh Brahmana, how did you orig how did the or how did originate the Natya Veda which you have properly composed and for whom is it meant? So they're asking a contextual question. For whom is the Natya Shastra? How many limbs does it possess? What are the different strains of thought in the Natya Shastra? But look at the body metaphor. And how is it to be applied? Spe please speak to us in detail about it all. Okay, this is Manmohan Ghosh's translation, not mine. And Bharata says, Brahmins, in the days of yore, the gods with Indra, Mahendra as their head, approached Brahman and spoke to him. We want an object of diversion which must be audible as well, well as visible. As the Vedas are not to be listened to by those born as Shudras, so look at the caste system, uh, be pleased to create another Veda which will belong to all. So you can see at the beginning of the Natya Shastra some negotiation of why you need a craft of theater, a craft of acting and of gesture and how this is for all. So again what you are getting here is the notion of gesture and acting uh, or mimesis as a, as a force towards democratization. And so I, we can study this in various ways, um, uh, but to get back to something that I, I want to look at, you have you, do you know this representation? What is this? You don't know? So this is the Penfield homunculus. Pen, so when you are self-reflecting about or when you're looking at me, uh, not all parts of the body are given the same representation in the brain. So the hands, you pay a lot of attention to the hands, but you hardly pay any attention to the feet. Cultures can change this. This is your natural predilection. But of course, dancers, Indian dancers will say, look at the feet. You know, they will, can change this, they can negotiate this. We cannot say that it is eternally true that human beings pay attention to the hands, but they do pay attention to the hands because it's closer to the face. Do they pay attention to the lips? Yes, because of speech. So your brain is self 
representing itself and representing the other. In t and this is what your brain is. So Penfield, Wilder Penfield discovered this when he was looking at patients with stroke. And uh, there are many representations of this. So hands and lips, the body itself is small. Um, the eyes are, rep uh, you know, go attention goes to the eyes, but in a very focused way. So this is, so the self-representation or self-reflexivity is always going on. Our job is to try to translate between the highly theorized cultural manifestations and the representations in the brain. So there, of course, we have to collaborate, as Chomsky says, with the neurologists. Um, so, uh, his Chomsky said this, right? We must study the body. No, Chomsky didn't say this. Sorry, I did this, learning from Chomsky. The body today is a zone where language is forced to meet its other, which is society, etc. I should stop there. It's time. I wanted to end with a picture which I was studying in terms of typologies of the body, but Jeff was studying in terms of the mutiny. So, this. This picture, do you know this picture? It's in the British Museum. First thing you go in, you will see this picture. And uh, it's right there. It's a huge big picture. It's about the mutiny or the first war of Indian independence. And I, if you look at the iconography of this, you can't see it very clearly. But the natives are all on the floor and crouching. And the... British are tall on these white horses. There's the burning city in the background. And, you know, I studied all the bodies in detail in this one and in various. And you can see that there is a um, body which is being negotiated. And because I'm interested in typologies, it got me thinking. And I read, so here I would like a reading list. Have you come across any typologies of the body? I found none. And again, I was very surprised because I was thinking, you know, there must be a typology of the colonial body. But in fact, there wasn't, uh, or any kind of body. So I began to think about it, and I began to think, well, if I want to look at gesture seriously and universals in gesture, maybe we should be, we all have physical bodies, and one problem is we are trapped in our physical bodies. Do you agree? <coughs> yes? So we have physical bodies, then we have emotional bodies, such as the bodies we imagine we have. So bulimia and, you know, how we think of ourselves, whether we are attached to our bodies. We do have emotional bodies, so, uh, and imagined bodies, which is in literature and myth and so on. So I thought if we begin with looking in our context, again, India, where you have post-coloniality and, uh, you know, the sort of... Um, the uh, this type of representation and then lots of them and you want to think also in terms of imagined bodies then maybe we should be thinking that we begin with a large physical body so infants have a very extended physical body then you have an emotional body developing and finally you get to the imagined body for the infant for the child but when now, I think that our imagined bodies are the largest and our physical bodies are the smallest in internal representation. But this is a difficult thesis to prove. But if we think of what our physical bodies, we can think physical bodies are associated with sensate creatures. They are capable of movement. They reproduce. I'm talking about mammals and most uh, most living things have interiors and exteriors uh, interiors and exteriors and are subject to death these are my criteria but we can add to them um, emotional bodies are associated with the higher mammals and have three further characteristics they feel pain as well as pleasure and experience a range of subjective emotions or brain states darwin's thing 
fear, love, and hate. Um, and then you have typical gestures of body language associated with these emotions, and they periodically dream. This is the emotional body. And if we think about the imagined body, now critical theorists and all this sort of stuff, so these are my categories, and I'm sure they can be criticized, but, but like Darwin, I tried. Uh, the medical body, you can think of the an anorexic or bulimic body, the hybrid body, the racial body, which you get in co colonial pictures, stigmatized bodies like Dalit body, the ghostly or spiritual body, malformed body, the body as a festoon. So here we can get the body as a narrative device. And this is the most sophisticated representation. So now we can study all this by beginning to think of something. I mean, you don't have to select gesture, but I'm saying something which seems common to all human beings, and then try to see whether we can think of typological characteristics which we can problematize and study. So I want to go from this notion of implicature to thinking about how we evolve apply how we read meaning into physical objects as and we read mental states uh, in connection with physical objects so i'll end with one of my favorite pictures oh no 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 one minute please i have one more thing i want you to just i'm going to read you a poem i chose it because whenever i read logic and philosophy it's my poem you can criticize it okay Okay, I chose it because it's a visual shape. You can see it's a triangular shape, right? And uh, I often write in shapes, and this is about our feelings, emotions, our thoughts. Okay, it's a clean poem, right? It, mostly I don't write, but okay. So, love's language lost. Does it have any um, connotations for you? The title? Shakespeare. What's it, what does it mean? Love's labor lost, right? So I'm punning. But if you don't know that, you lose this. It's tacit knowledge. It's background information, according to Grice. You won't get that information. Then, so, uh, then you get, OK, so now I'm talking about love's language lost, and I'm talking about brain states, OK? She thinks, she thinks that he knows. She thinks that he knows that you believe. She thinks that he knows that you believe that I feel. She thinks that he knows that you believe that I feel that they imagine. She thinks that he knows that you believe that I feel that they imagine that we sense. She senses that he imagines that you feel that I believe that they think. She imagines that he feels that you believe that they know. She feels that he imagines that I believe. He, she believes that he feels. She imagines. Love's lost language. So, you know what you do is, uh, when you're doing linguistics, you should never forget that words will give you structure. They will give you an actual structural vocabulary to think of feelings, thoughts. This is a love poem, but it's about imagining others' intentional states. And that, you know, love doesn't take place like that, you know, uh, falling in love. It takes place with all this thinking, believing, intending, what the other person is thinking, what we are imagining, etc. So if I can put it into, and I write formally, so oh, everything has form, even though I hide it, sometimes it's not hidden here, uh, a structure. And that's what I wanted to show, that um, you know, uh, what we're studying is also something literary and beautiful, could be beautiful. Okay, thank you.